dive into inositol. What is that? And why did you choose this supplement for metabolic, like in the metabolic health space? Yeah. And so I think that, again, it was kind of serendipitous. Um, I am a thin phenotype PCOS patient. I went through a lot of infertility um, and, and through my own journey, I, I understood that oral contraceptives masked my PCOS until I was ready to start a family with my husband. And I was really shocked slash disappointed that, yes, oral contraceptives ensured that I had a cycle every month. Um, I had terrible PM PMS while I was on the pill. In fact, I didn't know I didn't have PMS until I went off, but it hit all of those symptoms for so many years. So, you know, keeping me in a very low estrogen state, I know that wasn't the impetus for this conversation, but the more I interview other GYNs and experts in PCOS, I started to understand that a lot of what's at the basis, even if you're thin is um, inflammation, oxidative stress, and a degree of insulin resistance, even if it's not yet showing up on your labs, it's the most common endocrine disorder in the country, not hypothyroidism, it is PCOS, it is so common, and yet it is so underdiagnosed. So initially I came to it as I was learning about PCOS and, and at a different level, like obviously um, people like Dr. Felice Gersh, who I think has written the best book on PCOS that's out there, quite honestly, I think it's like the definitive guide to PCOS. Um, you know, people like that, that I have gotten to understand and know and be educated through and by really changed my perspective because I thought, hmm, if it's good for PCOS, and I start looking at the research, it's really good for metabolic health disorders. It's really good for insulin resistance separately from PCOS. And if a lot of what we're talking about in the metabolic health space is that only about seven to 8% of Americans right now are metabolically healthy, it's like, heck, we all need this. I don't care who you are. Um, I initially came to it through that lens and really thought about it. Like when I have someone in my practice that has PCOS, we should add this into their regimen. But then I started reading more about the changes in sleep architecture. Almost all of my people have issues staying asleep. They fall asleep. They can't stay asleep. They wake up between one and three, two and four. They're miserable. I have some women who've had 20 years of poor quality sleep being in perimenopause and menopause, which is a crime, because if there's any healthcare practitioner out there who thinks that's acceptable for women, that's a crime. Um, and so I, I then became interested in really looking at the research, like what is happening on a mitochondrial level that is impacting sleep architecture. So then I went down that rabbit hole and then I realized there's really good research on mood disorders. And I just had an expert on, because this is again, not my area of expertise, um, OCD. So obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, ADHD, depression, um, in, in terms of its interrelationship with serotonin and dopamine signaling and other neurotransmitters, and then helping people understand at the very basis of all this is helping with insulin sensitivity.